Father God, I thank you that, uh, that, that you supersede all of our little crisis, Lord. Whether they're electronic crisis or emotional crisis, Lord, financial crisis. And Lord, you meet with us right here. And we welcome your presence, Lord. We, we know we don't have to beg you to come. You say you're here when we gather together in the name of Jesus. And we're so grateful, Lord, for the way that you drew us to yourself. We're thankful, Lord, for the, the way the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, somehow broke through the, the calloused hearts that many of us had, Lord. And you made yourself real. And the way you got our attention, Lord, and drew us to that place of the cross, the sacrifice that was sufficient for our sins to be cleansed. Thank you for that tonight. God, I thank you so much for, for others like Ryan and Jen that are determined to take this gospel to those who have not heard. Father, forgive us for rehearsing it over and over and over and over again and, and yet hardly ever finding time or the courage to share it with somebody else. So Lord, please get us over that hurdle and uh, accomplish your work through us. And thank you for your word, Lord, that's going to speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, here, we, here we go. We're, we're going, okay? Um, uh, Leviticus chapter 4. And uh, study is still the same, God's law and our liberty. And we've been looking, last week I, I showed you this, the different breakdowns in the book of Leviticus. And we're still in the first section there, which is about the rituals. And we're going to look over the, 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 the pack of, uh, of sacrifices and what they were for and which ones were about uh, celebration and which ones were about gratitude. And then uh, and we'll just leave it right at that. We won't, we won't get all the way through chapter 7 tonight. I don't even think we'll, we'll, get, I don't think we'll get anywhere near that. But remember who, who's speaking right here. The words that we're reading right here. There's no question that you can depend on the words that you're going to read. They should be, I, I've said this before, if Jesus' words are in red in the Bible, why aren't God's words, God the Father's words, in gold in our Bible? You know, so you can see the difference between when he's speaking and when Moses is speaking and when Moses is reacting or responding. But it tells us in the beginning of Leviticus that God spoke to Moses from that tent, the tabernacle of meeting. So he called them into that meeting place for him. And not everybody got to go into the, the tabernacle. We talked about that when we were back in the book of Exodus. But Moses did get to go in and have these conversations with God and up on the mountain as well. But at this point, God is just rolling out for him how his people are supposed to approach him when it comes to issues in our life of either good things, how we should respond when God does something wonderful, and how we should respond when we've done something, what's the other side of wonderful? Unwonderful, very unwonderful, all the way to wicked or evil. And you're going to see even if it's like, oops, I didn't mean to do that. How many of you have ever done something like that? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, how many of you have ever backed into a, uh, a pole in the parking lot? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And, and so you, you didn't go out and plan to do that. We're going to talk about that tonight. But we're, we're in the tabernacle. We're listening to God speak to Moses. And the obvious focus all the way through Leviticus, really, is holiness. You know that of all the words that the, the Bible is full of that says God is, God is, God is. There's God is love and God is good and God is faithful and God is holy. And uh, can I see the hands of the holy people in the room that are just holy because of the, your own intrinsic holiness. All the honest people are keeping their hands in their laps right now because none of us are. But if God is holy and we're not, how can we ever get to know him? How can we ever approach him? And that's what all of these sacrifices are about. How unholy or sinful people who have, yeah, some of it is we've made mistakes and they were dumb mistakes and they were, con they, were, they were mistakes that had consequences. But how can we be reunited with God? Said this a couple of times already. All of these sacrifices are pointing to the one sacrifice. How many of you are aware of this? That um, our, our, our Jewish friends don't offer sacrifices in the temple anymore. They're looking for the day that they will. 
that the temple will be rebuilt and there will be sacrifices. But, but I, I, God did away with that sacrificial system because the sacrifice had been made in Christ. They will still do that because they, they still feel like, well, we need to have our, our worship set up the way God prescribed it to, and we can't just do that anywhere. So they pray, and, and they offer offerings like we offer offerings, and they, and they recite prayers, and they sing, and they'll fast, and they'll feast according to God's law, according to God's uh, call upon their life. But the obvious focus in the book is holiness. God is holy, so his people are called to be holy as well. So it, just in a little bit of review, and I will not do this every week, but uh, in a little bit of review, uh, Leviticus opens up with five different offerings. And there are two different kinds of offerings. The offerings that say thank you, and the offerings that say, God, I'm sorry. When, when God does something great, you want to say thank you to him. And there was a, a prescribed way of doing that. And so let me just jot these down for you. Jot, they're already jotted. Let me just show you. Here's what we're going to see tonight. We've already covered chapter 1 with the burnt offering. And it starts with an I'm, I'm sorry. And I'll get back to that in a second. But chapter 2 goes into the thank you offering. When God has blessed your fields or you just want to say, God, I'm so grateful, you would bring um, a, a thank you offering of grain. And that could be grain or, or cakes or finely ground flour, and you would offer that. Yeah, um, in chapter 3, last week, we looked at the peace offering. Another thank you. And this one was wonderful because it was having a meal with God. You, he, he would take some, some of the portion, would go up to him and smoke, and some of it you would eat. And I told you last week you could have up to two days to eat it. On the third day, no, you don't eat it anymore. But you had two days you could be at the table with God. So all of those offerings, the two offerings that were ways, one, two of the offerings were those ways of, of saying thank you, and three offerings, the ways of saying I'm sorry to God. Now notice, the burnt offering, it's the first of the I'm sorry's. Why would it start with that one? Now, it doesn't really give us a definitive answer to that, but here's, here's my sense of a, maybe a clue to it. We were born with a problem. Anybody know what your problem was? No, it's not that you weren't born rich or handsome or beautiful, and somebody would debate you on that. We were born with the problem of sin, not because we had sin, but because it, we had inherited sin from two sinners, <laughs> mom and dad. And there's no way that Joy and I could welcome sinless children into the world because they got us. And we were sinners and we passed on that, that sin to God. And in 1 John chapter 5, um, or chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 10, I love the way that, that John opens that, uh, that little letter of his by saying, if any of you say you have, have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. And if any of you say you have not sinned, there's a difference there. If any of you say, well, I've never sinned, then you're calling God a liar because he said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's just Paul quoting what was, was very, very clear in the Old Testament. But if we say we have no sin, we're denying the fact that we were born with a sinful nature. And I've joked about this, but it's true that our beautiful little perfect granddaughter, Ida, will prove to Starlin and Cooper, by the way, it's Starlin's birthday today, but will prove to mommy and daddy that she was born with the same nature that they were. She, that Starlin and Cooper passed it on to her. So I believe that this first offering that we're, we're given in, in order to approach God, I think it's tied to that. That the very first offering that's on record is just coming forward with the fact that I, I need a savior. I, I, I've been born with this, and I'm sorry for the nature that I... Uh, how many of you have ever been sorry for the nature that you inherited? And you wish that you'd been born like, oh. And, but we all were born with the same thing. So before we ever committed a deliberate sin, we were still terminal. We still had this terminal virus. We were condemned. We would all die of this virus. It was COVID 1.0. And it hits everybody. 100% of us have, there's a 100% mortality rate except for those, that generation of believers who live until Jesus Christ returns. And then we will escape that judgment. Anybody want to be in that club? Oh, I, want to, I think we might be too, by the way. I really think we might be. But it has a 100% mortality rate. And nothing stops it. 
Masks don't stop it. Social distance is useless, and the whole human race is infected and dying with it. But there is a vaccine, and the vaccine is the blood of Jesus, and it covers it all, and it cancels the effect, the eternal effect of sin. Not my blood, not your blood, but the only one who was clean enough to die for sinners was Jesus. His blood covered all sin everywhere, every single kind. So chapter 1 is that burnt offering, totally burnt. No portion was to be eaten by the priest or the worshiper. The second offering in chapter 2, the meal offering, the grain offering, saying thank you to God. A handful of the grain was burnt on the altar. What happened to the rest of it? Anybody remember? A handful was taken out and burnt. Who got the rest of it? The priests got it. That was their groceries. They got to take that home with them. The third offering was the fellowship offering. It was another thank you offering. So two thank you offerings in chapter 2 and 3. And you'd bring cattle or sheep or goats. You'd burn the fat and the guts. And the rest was allowed to be eaten by priests and, and worshipers. The worshiper would have some of it. The priests would get some of that too. In chapter 4 through 6, where we'll be tonight, is the sin and the trespass offerings, the two last offering. Some, in some translations it calls it the guilt offering, the trespass offering. And you would offer a young bull for that. And no part of the sin offering and no part of the trespass offering was allowed to be eaten by anyone. It was all offered up to God in smoke. But now in chapter 4 we go back to the I'm sorry offering, the sin offering. So look at that with me. Let's read through chapter 4. I am going to uh, when we get to the point where it says this is how you, you, know, you, you kill the lamb or kill the ram or you kill the animal, it's so similar. I'll only fill in the points that are different, and you can read it all in detail later if you want to. But in chapter 4, follow along with me in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. If a person sins, what do you have in your Bible in the next word there? Unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bring, bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head. You'll see that all the way through here. Lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. Do you remember what laying the hand on, on the sacrifice was all about? Before the, the animal was killed, why were you touching it? Why, why were you laying your hand on his head? Transfer, passing it on, identifying with the animal that was going to go and die for you. As some have said you'd look it in the eye. I, I have this, uh, this uh, I guess it's an opinion I, I can't be solid on this, but I, I believe that, that Jesus, when he died, we know that he was lifted up from the earth. And I, if I be lifted up, and I don't picture Jesus hovering on a cross eight feet with his, his feet eight feet above the ground. I think when they lifted him up off the, the earth, it, it was just enough to, to get, him, get his feet out of the dirt, really. And he was probably with his feet nailed down to a cross and his arms nailed out, or his, maybe at his wrist, maybe in the palms, but his, his arms nailed down to the other side and slumping under the weight and, and dealing with the pain, he was probably, I think, it's, I think it's probable, I can't say for sure, I think he was probably at eye level with the people that would pass by. And when they built the, the, the tabernacle, now the tabernacle is built at this point, but when you would lay the animals on the altar, and you, you remember the height of the altar? It was about four and a half feet off the, off the ground, the top of the altar. Now, when, when they built the temple, it would be way up a ramp and, and it'd be way up above the, the worshipers down below. But in the tabernacle, that offering was almost at eye level with the person that was sacrificing it, looking into the eyes of that sacrifice. And it, it makes me shudder when I think about that, that you could walk by that cross at, the, at, at Calvary, at Golgotha, and anybody that was passing by on that busy road could have looked right into the eyes of the Lamb of God who was taking away the sin of the world, identifying with him. So you'd put your hand on him, and that was identifying with that, uh, that animal that was about to die for you. 
And so it says that he, uh, he shall lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. Verse 5, and then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle. I'll read this once, and it's repeated over and over again. So we'll see it splashing here and smeared there. Here's what happens with the blood. The anointed priest takes some of the blood, then brings it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle or splatter some of it of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns, the corners of the altar where there was a little bit of a buildup where you could tie a sacrifice down to the altar. So he'll put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which was in the tabernacle of meeting. So that would be the altar that was beyond the, the altar of sacrifice, but it still had those, those horns or those handles up on the top. So put some of it there in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall take from it all the fat of the bull as, a sin, as the sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove as it, has, as it was taken from the bull of sacrifice of the peace offering. And said, just like the last one, do the same kind of a, a, a butcher job on this. And sorry to be so blunt, but that's really what it was, carving up this sacrifice. And the priest shall burn them on the altar of incense. Or, I'm sorry, burn them on the altar of the burnt offering. But the bull's hide and all its flesh with its head and its legs and its entrails and offal. You know what the offal was? It was the guts. It was, and it was, it was what? It was awful. The offal was awful. And it would, it would reek. So you get that stuff out of the tabernacle and take it outside. It says the whole bull, verse 12, the whole bull he shall carry. I'm, I think he would have had some help in carrying the whole bull. Don't you think so? But whoever was in charge, let's get the rest of this carcass out of the tabernacle, outside the camp to a clean place. Well, it wouldn't be clean much longer. Where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out it shall be burned. Okay, that's how you treat it if the anointed priest has sinned. The introductory statement at the beginning of verse 4 is let's deal with those who sin unintentionally. That's a really intriguing thought to me. Those who sin unintentionally, what would that mean? Now, I didn't know this, but reading a Hebrew scholar on this said the Hebrew word behind that is hagag. Say that with me. Not, not hagag, sagag. Sagag. Say it one more time. And pretend like you're Hebrew. Sagag. And sagag means to err or go astray or to wander or to stagger. Can I see the hands of those who have ever erred, gone astray, wandered, and staggered? <laughs> That's all of us. But what about this in, un, un, unintentional thing? And, and here's the differences of opinion. And there's got to be several things in the category of unintentional sin. Sins of passion where you didn't intend to go out and blow off steam, or you didn't intend to go out and get yourself tempted. You, d you didn't make that plan in the morning, but there you are. Now, that would be maybe the least of, of the, uh, in, in my opinion, of what's really included in the unintentional sin. But if you caused accidental death, or you accidentally caused somebody death, you didn't go out to murder somebody, you remember the story in the Bible, if you're, you're chopping wood and your buddy's out there with you and the axe handle flies off. Anybody ever have that happen? The handle, I mean, a head of a hammer, a hand, not that you killed anybody, but the head of a hammer, head of an axe or something, and it flew off and it hit something, maybe broke something. In this case, if it kills somebody, well, you're still guilty of that person's death. But it's what? What do we call that? It's more like manslaughter. It's an accidental death. You didn't intend to do that, and no one is more brokenhearted about it than you. I mean, all, all the, the, the beating that Alex Baldwin took last week, and he's given a lot of people a beating too, which is really sad that people were so ready to jump on him and just beat the daylights out of him. Nobody could, could feel more remorse over that accidental death than him firing a gun, thinking that it was unloaded, and yet it was loaded. That would fall into this category, causing an accidental death or the kosher laws 
where maybe you, maybe you missed the, the Torah class when they were teaching about what not to eat, and, and maybe you just didn't get that far in your education yet, and you ate something, mom and dad said, honey, you're not allowed to eat that. No leaven on this day, or no, not that. No, 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 don't eat that shrimp. Isn't that sad? They couldn't have shrimp. And other things, Joy and I went over to uh, uh, a restaurant uh, a week ago, Sunday, and we sat down and had a bowl, each had a bowl of clam chowder. Anybody like clam chowder? To begin with, Jews were not allowed to eat the clams. So let's let's say that it's potato soup, but a wonderful potato soup. But Joy and I sat down, and, and I can eat clams. Anybody else here like clams? Shrimp, lobster, want to go out to dinner afterwards? But we're digging in, into the soup, and, and I see something in there that I don't think that's a clam. And, and I, I pulled it up, and it was still alive. No, it wasn't. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I pulled it up, and it was bacon in my clam chowder. And I guess that's fine. I just don't eat bacon. And it's nothing religious. I, I, there's some things I just don't eat, and so I, I, I don't eat bacon, so I fished out the... But if, if you're eating along in your, in your soup and that mom's made for you, and, or maybe you picked it up at the market, and you want to say, hey, we just want some nice potato soup. Oh, we got wonderful potato soup. And then you're down at the bottom, and, and you've been eating soup that's got bacon in it. That's, it. that's, a, that's a sin. That's a violation of the kosher laws. And so they, maybe that's an unintentional sin. Or sitting on a tombstone accidentally. What did that make you? Made you unclean. If you touched anything dead or anything that was, was connected with death. That's why tombs were painted white. If people were, and, and you'll see this all over Israel and all many parts of the world. As you're driving along the road from Tiberias to, to Migdal and going north up into uh, um, Galilee or up into the far north in, in the Caesarea Philippi, as you're coming out of, of Tiberias, you'll see holes in the side of the mountain. And for a while, for years, you'd see the sarcophagus just laying there on the side, and there were graves just beside the road. And so they would paint the tomb stone, or the, the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb, they would paint it white so that you and know, don't sit on this stone. This is not just a stone. This is a death stone. You could be unclean. And if you did that and somebody said, oh, dude, I don't know how you say that in Hebrew, but dude, you, you, you're unclean. You, and for a while, you're unclean. Or if you accidentally brushed against a leper and now you're unclean. All kinds of ways that you could accidentally do something. Like, you know, you're down at, at uh, Surfside one morning and, uh, and your wife is gone for the weekend. You think, you know, I've got a little more time down here this morning. I've always wanted to walk out that jetty all the way to the end of the jetty. And so I thought, I'm going to do that today. And it was kind of lowish tide, and so I'm up there. And it's like, I think, a half a mile or maybe even longer to get out to the end of the jetty. And so here, here's what it looked like as I started. I think I've got a picture for you. So it's beautiful morning. Tide was low. And so I'm, I'm on this side of the fence, and I'm just walking on out, and I got almost out to the very end. And it was wonderful, and it was a sunny day, and I got a lot of wonderful pictures. And then I heard a siren, and it was naval security. You you see, that's not a fishing rod on the front of that boat. That's a gun. And I hear a siren, and I I thought there's somebody, you know, uh, maybe an ambulance going down PCH. And so I just kept on going, walking out to to the end. And then I hear, turn around and go back to where you came from thinking, Cincinnati? It's a long way to go back to Cincinnati. But no, they said, and and then they got over closer, and they were talking to me. They wanted me to to get off of the jetty. And so I I eventually, well, I did. I started making my way. But when I got there, here was this guy who wanted to get to know me. And he said, you're not allowed out here. I said, how would I know that I wasn't allowed out here? There was no sign that said I was not allowed out here. He said, you know, you're, you're right about that. There should be more signs out here. But I think I came this close to getting cited, or at least getting a citation and being called in, but he showed me grace. Anybody happy with me about that, that he showed me grace? Yeah, me, me too. But who knows, the, the, the list could go on and on. And I wonder how many of these, oh, I think I might have done something, can, and you would take it to a priest, who of course the pre, I mean, the, not, not the priest, but the scholars, and they would deliberate over what you did and decide whether it was a sin, an intentional sin, an unintentional sin. And maybe some of those cases were, were sort of downgraded to unintentional, which was a little bit uh, uh, 
less in the consequences, but, but maybe not a whole lot. But here, here's the point that, that's made, especially in this section on the unintentional sin. Sin is deadly and it's devastating, whether it's intentional and deliberate and belligerent or oops, I didn't mean to do that. I really, truly didn't mean to do that. Sin is, is deadly. It's devastating. Whatever, whatever kind of sin it is. The wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. And the soul that sins, it shall die. So how do you deal with the sin? <clears throat> well, to begin with, on the unintentional sin, I think it's interesting. They deal with the, the sin of the priest first. And you know, it's, it's just simple. If the sin, uh, if a priest has sinned, an unintentional sin, the whole congregation of the people was impacted by that because this is a revered leader of theirs. Some translations here say it's the high priest, that the anointed priest was the high priest, but all the priests would have been anointed to some degree to go about their, their duties in the tabernacle. But if the priest sins, who should have known better, knowing the law, then he brings the guilt on the people. And they bear this too. So that, that should make any Christian leader shudder a little bit. Because it really is, if a, if a leader falls, if a Christian leader falls, there's, there's maybe more damage. Maybe there's more reciprocal damage. Maybe more discouragement in the hearts of the people that have looked up to him or looked up to her. And some of them will say, well, my goodness, if they can't walk straight, how can I ever walk straight? But if the leader... If, the, if this level of leadership, if a, if a priest dies, what do you do? You offer a young bull without blemish. And the hand goes on the head of, and we read all that, so we don't need to go over that again. But you offer an animal that dies in your place. And, there's the, and, and it's, it's atoned for in that way. In verse 13 to verse 21, how to deal with the unintentional sin of the whole congregation. And what could the whole congregation do? that would be a sin. Maybe, maybe it's the assumption, and again, possibly it's something they hadn't been completely schooled in, and maybe their elder that was in charge of their instruction in, in, in their tribe of all these 12 tribes that are moving through the, the wilderness, maybe he hadn't done his job in, in training people, but still, if you step across the line, then you're guilty, and something has to be done. Some, it has to be dealt with. So how to deal with the unintentional sin in the whole congregation? It says, verse 13, now, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle. Okay, so if it's the whole congregation, then the whole congregation's involved in this and they bring it before the, the, the priest and a young bull. And here's the differences that you're going to see in all of these, uh, these different um, um, categories of the, the priest who sins, the congregation that sins, uh, what if it's a ruler that sins, and this goes on and on. But from verse 13 uh, down to verse 21, the, the instructions for the offering are the young bull, and it tells us down here, let me get down to this, uh, it speaks about the elders. Verse 9, and the elders of the congregation, they're the representatives, they're the leaders. The elders are the ones, remember when, when Moses was told by God, find 70 men. Uh, by his, well, his, uh, his, his father-in-law told him, you need help. And so he, by the wisdom of God, he got 70 other, you know, well-respected elders in the congregation, and they spread out throughout the whole multitude of Israel. And so it's their responsibility to deal with these kind of issues and to, 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 to walk in wisdom and to rule in wisdom. So the elders are called in, and I think it's all 70 of them, says, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. I would imagine that would take some time if it's 70 of them. And maybe they file by the bull, and uh, I would imagine that this whole issue, the announcement that's made to the congregation, hey, we've all blown it, we've blown it as a, as a people, and we have to atone for this. And so the elders come together and they walk by and maybe they just touch the head. And 70 of them go by. And I think that's possibly the inference there. But the elders of the congregation lay their hands on the bull. 
then the bull will be killed and the anointed priest shall bring some of the blood and what you're going to read from there on is basically the same thing that we've read. So that's how you atone for the whole congregation that sins. Get the elders who are the responsible leaders and bring them in to be a part of this on behalf of the people. Look down at verse 22. It says, now when a ruler has sinned, and maybe that's an elder, when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentional, unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord his God in anything which should not be done and is guilty or if his sin which he has committed comes to the, his knowledge he shall bring as his offering and here's the distinction here in this one the offering for him for the elder or the, or the leader is a kid of the goats that's a, a, a young goat uh, but a male one will be offered without blemish, and, and all except one of them, it says, without blemish. I don't know if it just wasn't written, or if they forgot to write it down, or if in one case it was just, well, just get this, this animal and sacrifice this, and we'll see that in just a second. So if it's a, a ruler, you offer, offer a male kid of the goat with no blemish, and it's basically in the same way. Look at verse 27. We go down to the common people. Now, anybody here a priest? Is anybody here a congregation? No, you're not a congregation. <laughs> you're in a congregation. Is anybody here an elder or a ruler, you know? So if you're, if you're none of those and you're not in the leadership structure, you know what you are? You're like me. You're common folk. And so it says, if the common people, can I see the hands of the common people? We're all common. In verse 17, or 27, if any of the common people sins unintentionally, here we go again, by doing something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. And again, he shall lay his hand, this common person will lay his hand on the head and on through the, the sacrifice. Now he, this is interesting. It says down in verse 32, still on the common people, if he brings a, as a lamb as his sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. So he had a choice. He could bring a goat or he could bring a lamb. He had the choice. He could, he could bring any of those. And um, I think that, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's it on the common folks. But why the choice? Why would he be given a choice between a kid of the goat or a, a kid of, of of the, of the sheep. I'll tell you why. I don't know why. It could be because of availability. It could be because of value between the kid and the goat. I looked up what's more valuable, uh, a goat or a sheep. And you know what? It depends on where you're raising them. If you're raising uh, your animals in a place where there's lots of grass, well, the sheep can eat better. If you're raising in a place where there's not a lot of grass, the goats seem to get by a whole lot better. And there were some opinions on that one of them produces more offspring than the other, and maybe that makes them more valuable. But if you, and, and maybe it, it really just was of availability. If you had goat, if you raised goats, but you didn't raise sheep, and almost everybody would have had a goat. Almost everybody would have had a lamb or two or, or a handful for their own personal livelihood. But you have the choice on that one. Now, do we get the point? Here's the point. Do we get the point? I mean, it's so clear. Again, bottom line is that sin is a very costly practice. And again, the wages of sin is death. And it's brutal. It's brutal especially for who? For the goat. And for the sheep. And for the bull. Or for the bird that's, that's going to be offered. The wages of sin is death. But this was a very... Listen carefully to this. As brutal as this sounds for all animal lovers everywhere, <laughs> it's, um, it was a very merciful system that God put in place, a merciful measure that God put in place for two reasons. We get to live and yet deal with our sins by allowing a, a substitute to take our place. I would imagine that for the thinking person and a person with a heart, there had to be a sense of gratitude both to God and to this animal that you had raised and that might have, might have become a pet to your family. Who knows? But, but it, it was merciful of God in these, for these two reasons that we get to live and have an opportunity to change our ways. Why? Because I don't want to kill another animal because I've 
because I've been foolish, because I've been careless. I want to live more carefully. I want to live in a way that doesn't cause damage to other people. I, I think that had to settle into the hearts of some people. The second reason is that we get a picture of the cure of sin that was on the way to the point where in, in, uh, in John chapter 1, when John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, and it's baptism day, it's another baptism day. Unlike the baptisms that, that we do here, it was hordes of people that had just come out to, to confess their sins and get their heart right with God to do what? What, what was it that John preached? To prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths. In other words, walk in straight paths. Don't, don't be zigzagging away from God, but walk straight towards him and be prepared for the, the, the what did he say that day when Jesus shows up? He points to the crowd and he says, look, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know how many other statements he could have made that identify Jesus? He could have said, look, there's the King of kings. There's the Lord of lords. And those are people that rule and reign. That's our Messiah. He's going to boot out the, the Romans, but he didn't. He said, here comes a sacrificial animal. That is the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. Whew. Man, that gets me. It, it, it all pointed to Jesus. Every single bit of it pointed to the Lamb of God that would eradicate sin for all of us that would receive that, that offering and that gift. Well, we're not done with the sacrifices. Look over at chapter 5. And I don't think we'll get all the way through chapter 5. We'll put a comma wherever we have to. You know why? Because we're going to do this again next week. We'll be back and we'll keep digging through this. In verse 1 down to verse 6, sins that required a sin offering. Listen to this. If a person sins in the hearing, or I'm sorry, if a person sins, and here's a sin, in hearing the utterance of an oath and is a witness whether he has seen or known of the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. Or if a person touches anything uh, any unclean thing, whether it's the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of an unclean livestock, well, what do we just read? There'd be a lot of carcasses of both clean and, and unclean animals that died here or there, but there would have been carcasses of clean beasts that they had taken outside the camp or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and he is unaware of it, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanness, whatever uncleanness with, with which a man may be defiled and he's unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a person swears speaking thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatever it is that a man may pronounce by an oath and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty in any of these matters, and it shall be when he's guilty in any of these matters that he shall, look at this, what's this word? Confess it. Admit it. Don't hide it. Don't say what? No big deal. It wasn't a big deal. So I saw it and I didn't say it. So big deal. People do that all the time. Exactly, people do that all the time. But, he, but he's not done. There's one more. And it shall be when he's guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing and he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. Sins that required uh, a sin offering. The failure or the refusal to come forward as a witness in, in, a, in a certain kind of a case. They were commanded to do that. It wasn't, no, I don't think I want to go to court on that. No, no don't call me. I just don't call me. It was a sin and needed to be atoned for. The contact with these unclean animals or unclean human stuff, and we'll get into that in just some other, as we get deeper into Leviticus, that'll pop up again. But in Genesis chapter 7, there was already the beginning of an understanding of these animals are clean and these animals are not clean. And so if you've touched something unclean and that has made you unclean, they, they were aware of those things. We'll get, again, get into more detail on the clean and unclean items later on, so we'll save more comment for that. But for making a foolish vow of any kind, 
there was atonement for that. Just in saying stupid things. Yes, I'll do that. And, and, and if it was brought to your attention, you had to make atonement for it. But in all of these things, and this, was, this is a part of our steps toward Jesus as well, our steps towards forgiveness and our steps toward getting the burden of our sin lifted. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Well, why don't I have to, why don't I have to go kill a lamb? Why don't, I have to, I, why don't I have to go kill a goat? Because the lamb's already been killed. And you identify with him. If we confess him as our Lord and Savior, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, all uncleanness. And like that, we are restored bears repeating what Brother Harold used to say with his deep, wonderful, 79-year-old voice. He would say, oh, Brother Bill. I, I, I love this man. He said, oh, Brother Bill, instant confession brings instant cleansing and forgiveness. And he said, don't you, basically saying, don't you forget it. Don't grovel in, in what's been lifted. Don't hang in, in that, that slop of a feeling of, oh, I'm still such a jerk. For it's cleansed. And, 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 and you're forgiven. Your sin has been lifted. Let the burden of it be lifted as well. But in, in uh, verses 1 to 6, there, here's the offering. Bring the lamb or the kid goat. Or it says two turtle doves or two pigeons. You want to see that offering? I, I don't know where I got this picture. Nope. There, there it is. There it is. Aren't they cute? And what was the priest supposed to do with these when you brought it? Uh, I was going to give you some sound effects. I won't do that for you. This is what he was supposed to do with it. You would, I didn't do that, by the way. That was, I told you about this last week, and I found the picture that I'd taken of that. It really looks like somebody had done exactly what God commanded them to do. If you're going to bring a bird, two birds, you would, you would wring off the neck. See where it's red right under the chest? That would have been where the crop was. It was taken out, and it was laid out there like it was a sacrifice in the wetlands about five, six years ago. But that you would bring the offering, whatever you could afford, uh, and, and the animal would be sacrificed for you, and you were free. And the burden of it was lifted. There was no... No season where you had to wait and wait and wait until that was completed. It was done, and you were free to go. What a, what a great thing. That's how we're, we're not going to end quite there yet. I want to go to verse 14 and 16. So that was all the way down to verse 13, but look at verse 14 to 16. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things, I think that has to do with the holy articles maybe in the... Uh, in the tabernacle or the furnishings or the offerings or maybe messing with the tithes or something like that. In regard to the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring to the Lord as his trespass offering a ram without blemish. That's a male sheep without blemish from the flocks with your valuation in shekels of silver. And this seems to have been the restitution for whatever you broke or whatever you took. The re restitution in silver coins according to the shekel of the sanctuary as a trespass offering and he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing and shall add one fifth to it and give it to the priest in other words what it was worth and then add another 20 percent to the value so the you know there was some there was some hurt and what, whatever you'd done whatever you'd messed with whatever you'd broken and <laughs> i remember I was telling somebody about this Today, uh, I, I've told you this before. I was raised Catholic, and uh, Alan, were you a, were you an altar boy too? No, this was fun. You would you you would enjoy this. You, you I didn't so much like the dress kind of thing they put you in, but when it was it was holy days, um, they brought out the incense burner, and I'll never forget this one day that I got to go. When it was time, the priest would nod to me or somehow signal, and I got to go back into the, the little room off the side of the altar and light the incense burner and then bring it out to him, and he would start to swing it, you know. And, and I, I still love the smell of incense. So he, and, and I did my job, and he started swinging it. But I'd done my job except for one thing. I had not locked the top of the incense burner down. 
and the incense was burning, and he starts to swing it. And he went a little, maybe a little too high, but uh, it, it, the burning incense fell out of the incense burner and fell down on the carpet that had just been installed very, very recently. They'd saved for a long time to put carpet up on the altar. And, it, and the, the priest, <laughs> I don't remember if he looked at me or not. Uh, he should have looked at me and scowled, but he, he, he just walked over to the side where there was a little bowl of holy water, and he came over with the holy water, did something very practical with the holy water, and put out the fire that had been my fault. I went back and visited that church, not the church, but uh, some friends in Batavia, Ohio, years later, the Haglidge family, and Mrs. Haglidge, probably 25 years after, she said, Billy Welsh, I remember you. You know, we just replaced the carpet that you had caused burn there all those years ago. Just held on to that for all that time and was able to dig at me with it. But anyway, but uh, whether it was something that you broke, you would restore. And then, then atonement had been made for what you had done. And we'll leave it there um, uh, as we prepare for communion. We just got a few minutes left. But I wanted to get further tonight because all of this, every bit of this, has this one wonderful word at the end of it. Whether it says it out loud, it, it does at the end, but it all has this one word. All of these offerings, all this sacrifice, all this blood, the twisting off of the neck of a bird, all of that. You know what that one word is at the end of all of those operations, all of those procedures? Forgiven. You're forgiven. And Jesus is the one who did the bloody work offering himself so we could be, be pronounced what? Say it with me. Forgiven. Now don't say it with a whisper. Say it with a little bit more volume. We can be pronounced what? Forgiven and clean, cleansed of our sin, welcomed in his presence. In the presence of who? A holy God. A holy God because he went to all this trouble to make this happen for us so that the doors fling open wide for us. So if the worship team is going to come back, because we've we got to close in song, but let's take some time and uh, go ahead and pull back the first little see-through tab on the top of your communion set there. You know, I think I could quote this from memory, but I always want to make sure I'm getting it right, because it, the way Paul put this is just so powerful, theologically beautiful, and relationally beautiful for you and I to know that what Jesus did was enough. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. I got it from God, I gave it to you, he said, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. We've read about the bodies of those animals that were broken, slashed, and drained of their blood. But Jesus, that night, he said, take and eat. This is my body, the sacrifice of my body, which is broken for you. And he looked around the table and, and he said to his disciples, everybody look up here. I can't look into all of your eyes. But he said, do this and remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget what I'm about to do for you. He'd been warning them for months that he would die. And now, less than a day before, he's, he's nailed to a cross outside the north wall of Jerusalem. He said, take this. This is my body that's broken for you. Do this and remember me. So Jesus, we want to do that tonight. We want to remember what you did. And we draw to our, our memory, Lord. We call to mind the brutal death that you experienced for us. More brutal than anything I think that's ever been seen. How you were loaded up with our sins. You who knew no sin, you became sin for us. And you took our sin to the cross. As you were sacrificed outside the camp, outside the city. 
as Jewish hands and Gentile hands were laid upon you, transferring our guilt to you. Tonight, Lord, we say thank you for your perfect body, your sinless body that was offered on our account, for our, our intentional and unintentional sins, for the sin we inherited and the sin we've committed, Lord. We confess to you that we have sinned. Thankful for your sacrifice for us. And we remember you now in Jesus' name. Thank you. Let's take the bread together. If I read it clearly, if I read it clearly in, in Scripture, it was later. last cup that was on the table and he lifted this cup up one cup by the way it wasn't a hundred cups it was one they all drank from the same and he said this in, in like manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me Jesus has given this as a, as a very tactile physical um reminder of what he did and he said do this in remembrance of me remember that my blood would be shed for you the cup of the new covenant so Lord tonight we take this cup and we receive it as a reminder though it is a sweet taste on our lips Lord it was a, it was a bitter cup that Jesus drank as he took our sins to that cross and we drink this tonight Lord to refresh us Remind us that our sins are forgiven and we're under a new covenant. And oh, we're so thankful to you for that, Lord. So thankful. So Lord, bless this cup as we partake of it together, this cup of forgiveness. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's drink together. sip, that sweet sip is enough to, to refresh my heart, yours too, refresh you and remind you, it's, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, let's stand together and let's give God praise over that before we go home, amen, I see the hands of, of those, you've already had them up probably, you see the hands of those who have, have believed on Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation. You need to tell yourself again that this is who I am. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm cleansed. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm not in bondage to sin anymore. Jesus dealt with that. He broke it. And walk out of here, dance out of here like the free person that you are in Jesus Christ. And if your hand wasn't just up, please, before you leave here, maybe grab the believer that you came in here with or one of the pastors and say, hey, would you pray with me? I, I, I want to get into this family. I want to know that my sins are forgiven and that my sinful nature has been canceled by the blood of Jesus and that I, I have life in Him. And you can have that in a moment by confessing your sin to Jesus and receiving His forgiveness, putting your simple faith in the power of the cross, what He did for you. So we'll finish up chapter 6 and uh, or 5 and 6 next week and continue to move through Leviticus, but read ahead on your own and fill in all those blanks about all the gory stuff that just was repetitive, but get your eyes back on the text and keep growing. All right, grace and peace to you. The strong name of the Lord loves you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.